Everybody has leaks. That's what happens now. I'm going to go print out the um, Nexus password list and just go put it on Twitter in a minute. So everybody has leaks. (laughs) Soon we will all be the Nexus because, like, anybody can log in. Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I'm Ian Arbuck, and today we have a very special episode for you. We're debuting a new format for the show! Woo! Usually on Second Opinion, we review one item at a time in each episode, but today we're doing a roundup. We're going to review several of the top apps in a particular category all together. Today's category is Password Managers. So password managers are one of the most effective tools that you can use to increase your personal security online. Um, And by the way, if you want to hear about additional steps that you can take to keep yourself secure besides just using password managers, uh, we're also releasing an episode of The Extra Dimension all about that at the same time as this episode. So go and look for that over at uh, thenexus.tv slash TED38. So since we're going to be reviewing several different apps in this one episode, uh, as you can imagine, there's going to be a few different segments in the episode. Uh, So if you want to jump around at all or go back and listen to a previous segment or skip one entirely, um, go ahead and look in the show notes for this episode for the timestamps uh, associated with each segment. Um, By the way, you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO54. Now, if you are someone who wants to have a nice visual layout of all of the features that we're talking about uh, as they correspond to each of the different password managers. Uh, Go to the show notes for this episode and uh, we've got a link in there to a spreadsheet where I uh, laid out a a nice big grid. It's nice and color-coded and you can see most of the information that we're talking about here in the episode. Uh, We might not talk about each of these features individually for each password manager. We'll be talking about them a little bit more holistically in the podcast Uh, but if you just want to see all of the features and how they and how they correspond um, go over to the nexus.tv slash so54 and look for the link to the spreadsheet so First off, we're going to start by uh, going through the features that are important to look for in uh, password managers. And that's just to make sure that we're all on the same page as we go through each app. Uh, Next, of course, we're going to dive into each app individually. Uh, I've tested all of them, and uh, I'll be bringing on a few friends uh, as we go, because the other hosts here at the Nexus... uh, use a variety of different password managers as well. Um, So I'm bringing on a few people who have more experience than I do uh, in a few of them. For each app, we'll be talking about each of the specific features that they have, noting anything that is particularly good or not good for each one. And then at the very end, once we are done talking about each app individually, uh, I'll wrap us up with a little debrief to talk about uh, which of the apps seems to be good in which cases. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. All right, so let's talk about some of those features that we're going to be looking for in our password managers. So first up, the essentials. These are the features that I consider to be so important that if a password manager does not have all of these, I wouldn't recommend anybody use it. Price is a pretty important one to talk about for each of these because it affects not only whether or not you as an individual will be able to afford to use uh, each password manager, but also um, it does affect how much each team, each company that is behind these password managers um, can put into the development and maintenance of these apps. Um, So we want to try to find a nice kind of balance there uh, in terms of price. Next up, we'll evaluate the reputation of each company because while we can't predict the future, we can't know for sure Uh, if any of these password managers are going to have a breach or if they're going to have uh, passwords stolen from them or anything like that, what we can do is take a look at what has happened in the past and how these uh, companies have responded to 
predict which of them will be able to protect your uh, data most effectively. So essentially we're just playing the probability game here. We definitely want to make sure that the password managers that you use uh, synchronizes between your devices because uh, while it is nice to have your password saved on your desktop, for example, that's not going to do you very much good when you're out and about using your phone and you need to log into one of your accounts. And that leads us nicely into taking a look at the different platforms that uh, the password manager is available on. Um, and even if you, you know, are somebody who only uses a couple of these platforms, right, maybe you just have a Windows computer and you've got an Android phone, um, it still is useful to make sure that a, the password manager that you're using is available very broadly on iOS and macOS and maybe even Linux uh, because that is a good indication that the team behind the app is putting forth a lot of effort into the development of it. Um, and also it means that you're not going to be tied into one specific platform if you ever decide that you want to uh, switch from one operating system to another. You don't want to have to export all of your uh, passwords from your password manager as well. We want our password managers to be able to capture any manually entered credentials. So for example, if I go and log into my Twitter account uh, in my browser and my password manager doesn't have my Twitter account uh, saved currently, we want it to be able to recognize that a password has been entered and automatically, uh, well, ask whether uh, I want it to save that password or not. Another very important feature uh, is random string generation for new passwords. So one of the big pitfalls that people fall into uh, when trying to secure themselves online is reusing passwords or reusing a pattern of passwords. Um, and I, the best solution to this problem is simply having passwords that are completely random that you don't know at all. They're not based on you know, English words or anything. Uh, they're just random strings of characters. Uh, and so if your password manager can automatically generate those for you and then store them right away as soon as you create them, um, then that will uh, remove a lot of the effort that you have to put in to keep your account secure. We also want our password managers to be able to import and export our, um, our collections of passwords. Um, and this is important because you don't want to get locked into one password manager, right? If you start paying for a subscription for, for one password manager and then you find out later that there's another one that has uh, some extra features that you're interested in trying out, you don't want to be locked into the one that you're using simply because it's difficult to export all of your passwords. And then we have the, in the user interface. Uh, it's, it's important to be using apps that aren't ugly. I mean, I guess you could use ugly apps, but like it's going to make your life so much more enjoyable to just have a user interface that is a pleasure to use, especially since this is something that you will be using on a regular basis um, whenever you have to log into an account. All right, that's it for essentials. Now we've got a few extra features. These are uh, cool things that a password manager might have built on top of the essentials um, that can differentiate it from the pack. Um, first up, we have being able to store non-password stuff. Uh, so as you probably already know, your passwords are not the only information in your life that you are trying to keep secure but still have access to wherever you go. Um, some password managers will allow you to input other pieces of information like your credit cards or some, uh, you know, your name, address, stuff like that to autofill into websites. Um, notes that are attached to the usernames and passwords. Um, router or server information like you know if you've got a wi-fi network that you um log into on a regular basis but of course you know the the password isn't synchronizing between all of your devices uh automatically um, government ids software licenses those are the types of things that typically we see uh, password managers offering to store for us in addition to the passwords Security audits are can be a very, very useful feature. Um, this is uh, the kind of thing where the app will 
analyze the passwords that you have stored and it will highlight things that might be concerning, right? Um, so it'll highlight any weak passwords that you uh, have, any duplicate passwords, right? If you're reusing the same password in multiple places, um, any email addresses that have been part of known breaches, um, services that have been compromised that you should change your password on, uh, and then also accounts that support two-factor authentication that you don't have enabled. Speaking of two-factor authentication, uh, some password managers do offer uh, two-factor authentication generators along with the password manager themselves. Um, what two-factor authentication is, is it's when you add an extra layer of security on an account um, where you put in your username and password, but then it goes through an, another step to verify that it's you by um, asking you for a code that is generated usually on your phone, right? Um, so this is proving that not only do you know your username and password, but you are also the person who has control of your phone. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a few different ways for two-factor authentication to be implemented. I think the best way, the, the, the way that gives us the most security without taking away too much convenience is to have an app on your phone that generates pass or that generates um, new codes every 30 seconds. And, uh, and so some password managers will have that built into them. Some password managers will also allow you to share your passwords with other people. Um, this is, can be a very useful feature if you um, are in like a family situation where several people share uh, a single account and you don't want to have to send out the password uh, to everybody again if you ever change it. Being able to organize your passwords, the different accounts that you have, stored in a password manager can be very useful to help you find the right one uh, within a timely manner. Auto change password is a really nifty feature that some password managers do where uh, essentially you just click one button and the password manager will go through the process of changing your password for you um, because it, it just takes away that that whole manual process of going into the account settings and uh, going to the change your password field and then you're just generating a new random password anyway um, and so because you know there's there's nothing that you need to be doing as the end user in that in that whole sit um, in that whole process you can just automate that process entirely alternative sync options uh, are can be very very important for those who are really concerned about security uh, most of these password managers that we're going to be hearing about um, synchronize your passwords your, your vault uh, up to their servers but if you want to have complete control over your um, your password collection you can synchronize it in other ways uh, in some apps Emergency contact access uh, can be a, a great fallback um, if you want somebody else to be able to access your accounts if something happens to you um, then you can uh, you can set that up in some of these password managers. Um, I do feel a little bit conflicted about this particular feature because most of the password managers tell us that, okay, we're storing these passwords, this vault, uh, completely encrypted based on your password, that your, the master password that you set for this password manager. And, uh, and so the password, like the company that runs the password manager cannot access any of your passwords. But if they are able to give somebody else access to your account without that person having your master password, then that, I, that pretty much negates everything that they said about not being able to access any of your passwords. So that, yeah, that feature is, is um, a little bit concerning if you, if you really, really want the best security. And then finally, um, a feature that is very, very important for uh, sanity when using a password manager on, especially on mobile devices, is um, the ability for for 
a password manager to authenticate you using the biometric scanners on your mobile device. So this would be like fingerprint scanners or iris scanners or facial recognition, that kind of thing. Um, if, if your phone has that built into it, you want to be able to... Uh, you don't want to have to put in your master password um, for, for your password manager every time that you're going to use it to fill in some passwords um, in another app. It, it's much, much more livable when you uh, can just put your finger onto the fingerprint sensor uh, and, have, uh, and have it recognize you there. All right, so those are all of the features that we're going to be looking at for these uh, password managers. Let's jump into each password manager individually. So first off, let's talk about the password storage systems that most browsers have built into them uh, by default and why those are not sufficient for me to recommend them uh, for people to use. Um, so first of all, what platforms are they available on? Well, they're only going to be available within that one browser. So if you use Firefox, right, um, you will you can save your passwords in Firefox, uh, and Firefox can synchronize those passwords to other copies of Firefox that you have installed on other computers, other devices, um, but you will never be able to take those passwords and uh, fill them in when you are using Chrome or when you are using um, a, like the Twitter app on your phone, right? You won't be able to autofill uh, your Twitter password into, into that field because um, it will only fill in passwords if you are in the browser. Um, now, that being said, uh, Chrome does synchronize their passwords with your Android devices and they let you uh, autofill those uh, in any apps that you're in on Android. Um, similarly, Safari uh, synchronizes via keychain to any iOS devices that you have, um, but neither of those will synchronize cross-platform to their uh, competitor's mobile operating system. The big advantage that these uh, built-in password storage systems have is that they are all free and they are all built in by default. So uh, if you don't go to the effort of figuring out what password manager you want to use, um, then you will just be using the one that's built into your, uh, into your browser. Uh, in terms of reputation, most of these browsers do have a good security reputation. Um, I think that Opera is the only one that I'm aware of that has had any uh, breaches uh, in the past, but I don't think that uh, anybody's passwords were uh, stolen as a result of that. Uh, do these synchronize across devices? Yes, they do, but again, only within that one browser that you use. Um, they can all capture the uh, the usernames and passwords that you enter in uh, and add those to your um, to your collection without you having to re-enter the passwords. For random string generation, uh, the only browser that offers that feature is Safari. None of the others will offer to generate a, a new password for you. None of them offer any import or export features, um, which was actually a very big frustration for me when I wanted to switch from using the built-in Chrome password manager to using LastPass. I uh, had to go into my Chrome settings and for each and every single one of those websites that I had stored, um, I actually uh, I installed the LastPass browser extension, and then um, I visited each one of those websites individually and um, had Chrome log into them for me. And as soon as LastPass detected that there was a password, a username and password being entered in on that uh, website, it offered to save those. So that was, needless to say, a very tedious experience. None of these browsers offer to store any other information besides usernames and passwords. None of the browsers will perform a security audit for you, uh, though Safari will warn you if you are using duplicate passwords. So it's got part of a security audit. None of the browsers uh, will allow you to share your passwords with other users. Um, they also don't offer any type of organization uh, or a two-factor authentication generator or emergency contact access. Uh, and then for biometric sensors, um, 
Chrome and Safari, uh, of course, since they synchronize their passwords to uh, Android and iOS respectively, um, they can use the biometric sensors on your mobile devices um, for the purposes of autofilling passwords into apps. So the built-in password managers in your browser, um, I cannot advise that you use it uh, over another more uh, purpose-built standalone password manager because there are a lot of other free options that um, have many, many more features that can help you to uh, keep your, your password secure. Um, so I definitely would recommend uh, switching to another one of these uh, password managers that we'll talk to talk about in a moment. Um, but if you're using your built-in browser password manager, uh, you're on your first step towards making your account secure. So to talk about our very first proper password manager here, uh, we're going to talk about LastPass with Ryan Rampersad, um, because Ryan is actually the person who got me started on LastPass. Um, before this, I was using Chrome's built-in um, you know, password saving system uh, in combination with a bunch of like written passwords on a piece of paper that I kept folded up in my wallet. And uh, you've come and a Ryan, long way. I, I ha yeah, and and the reason that I got onto LastPass was because you gave me, if I remember, like like a, a free one year uh, premium subscription for LastPass. Yeah, and uh, back at the time, like I think LastPass required a premium subscription to use on mobile or something. And yeah, I I think that yeah the cross device yeah. synchronization was tied in that yeah and nobody would use LastPass in real life if you couldn't use it across devices right so yeah. that was an easy way to convince somebody <laughs> and luckily during that year that i had the premium subscription they realized that they needed to make the uh the cross device synchronization into a free feature yeah and so once the premium subscription was up i didn't need to renew it i was like well i got everything i need exactly so, right cool but so it worked uh, yeah yeah, it, yeah. It, it totally did that's good. um so LastPass is um available in terms of the platforms that it's on uh pretty much everywhere that you could want and of course you can use the website version on any yes. other platform that has a browser so you're probably yep. set so in terms of price for LastPass, uh, like we said, the free version does now come with uh, cross-device synchronization. And honestly, like I think it has all of the the features that you probably need. Um, it has the main all of things, the essentials for sure. Yeah, like all the the things that are kind of behind the paywall these days are like the advanced sharing features. Yeah, um, which we'll talk about like, in a minute here. There, yeah, the, yeah. There, there's, there's some interesting ideas behind them, but you, you can see if you need them or not. Mm -hmm. Um. So if you want the premium version of LastPass, whether it's you know to get those features or just to help support ongoing um development of of the app, uh, it's twenty four dollars per year for a single person, uh, or forty eight dollars per year for a family of six. Yep. So I want to yeah. mention here that that price changed during my usage time of LastPass. Okay. So originally it was $12 a year, which is a dollar a month. That's a great price. It mm -hmm. feels more like you're supporting an individual person or a very small company at that price. When mm -hmm. you start getting to $24 a year and, and more, you know, you feel like you're going from supporting something to actually paying for it and then paying <laughs> for something that should be more robust and polished than maybe LastPass was at, at earlier points in its lifetime. Mm hmm. So I, I mean, let's get into the security reputation. Yeah. For LastPass, because this does also make me think about, okay, did that price change because LastPass got bought by LogMeIn? Right. So years ago, it was just a small business, probably a team of five-ish people. Um, you could see the people who worked on it also worked in the support form, like the support mm -hmm. contact pages. So mm -hmm. it was a very small team. Uh. And the features back then for, that were free were pretty good. I mean, you, you've got everything on your on your browser, uh, cross sync on browser, but then mobile required premium, and the premium price was twelve dollars a year. Very small ask, um, 
in terms of cost there. But eventually LogMeIn bought them. And at the time that happened, there was a lot of concern that LogMeIn would eventually ruin either the value of LastPass or ruin the security that LastPass had at the okay. time. Um, and because, what was the reasoning behind that? Like, what 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 is Logmian's primary business before so, they bought LastPass? Yeah, Pass? so there was a there was a service called I think it was called Logmian Himanchi. Me and mm, that does sound familiar. Himanchi, something like that, and it was basically a um, like VPN remote desktoping client. Logmian um, also has done other purchases and acquisitions apparently, and for whatever reason, the security community, I guess I'm not sure, um, doesn't like the company that much they don't hold them in that high regard (laughs) okay yeah um and that's that's not the only uh note that we have for for lastpass's reputation lastpass has also had a couple of breaches in the last few years um one was actually like they they did get a bunch of uh data stolen off of their servers correct yeah um the the hashed versions of uh of a bunch of users passwords uh vaults but um of course because since they were hashed like the the attackers um to the best of our knowledge did not actually get any but you know they didn't get access to anybody's uh passwords i think in general LastPass has been pretty good with their disclosures um i think they haven't been as forward with the development cycle and software itself though Okay. Um, and they certainly weren't very transparent when they were being purchased or selling themselves. <laughs> so there's that too. Um, the other vulnerability that we've uh, that we've encountered in LastPass, to the best of my knowledge, is um, there was like some some websites. No, okay. So the the browser extension was being tricked into filling in passwords in forms that it shouldn't have been? Something yeah, like that? something like that. So the LastPass extension can inject JavaScript into the page so that it can perform that auto-filling mechanism, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, somebody could craft a special script to manipulate that auto-filling script to basically arbitrarily auto-fill fake form fields. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe that's been patched, which is good. Um, so that's fine. Can LastPass store other security info? Um, yes. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I primarily what I've used uh, is you know it has like a notes field for a, you know if you've got a password stored for Reddit.com, right? You, you it'll give you just like a text box where you can type in any other notes that you want. Yep. Um, and so so I use he- I I make heavy use of that to store like. Um, answers to to security questions stuff like that exactly that's um, what i do as well yeah yeah i know that uh they've got like in beta is like form autofilling uh, and address stuff and credit card stuff um, yeah so i don't really use the f- uh address autofill for whatever reason i right. just i'm okay typing that but the uh the credit card autofill is okay i use that it uh, it doesn't seem to be quite as extensive a list as one password has um, which we'll be seeing in in a minute when I talk to Brian and Brandon um, but it is uh, yeah it's it's available there um, LastPass has a security audit and I love that it gives you like a score yeah, right I, from zero to a hundred percent I don't know the score thing is is cool but it I think it I don't know it kind of Kind of makes you wonder, like, because it is so arbitrary, and also ten mm-hmm. points are for MFA or something. I don't know. I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't like it that much. <laughs> like the auditing tool um, is great, but so so Ryan, I think it's so funny that you say that because I definitely remember you and Matt like competing back on at the Nexus oh, yeah. back in the day. Oh, I know. On who could have a higher percentage? I had a higher score. Yes, I understand. <laughs> But but now in retrospect, I I don't like having a score number. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think you need to know that. I think you should just. I mean, it should be like an anti-score, like you know, in golf, like the more swings oh, sure. you take, the wor- the higher score you get, which means it's worse. <laughs> um, one of the features that LastPass has is sharing passwords. Mm-hmm. Of course, it it requires Ryan to be using a LastPass account as well for him to receive the password, which, you know, while it is a version of, like, lock-in, um, 
for passwords, that does seem kind of reasonable. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Especially since, like, part of this feature is if I ever change the password, then Ryan gets the updated version of the password immediately as well, um, which is which is a really good uh, p- part of that feature. Yeah, I I never really used that feature. Um, yeah, I know. Even though we were both using LastPass for a couple of years, uh, yeah. you refused to use that feature to share passwords with me. <laughs> I don't believe in the lock-in. I don't want. I don't want to know about it. Sure. LastPass allows you to organize your passwords with uh, different folders. Man, oh man, I have so many different folders. Usually, I'm not using the folders to be able to find things because I just there's a search bar, so I just yeah. search. <laughs> yep, I agree. So do do you um, use the favorites at all? Because you, I think you can favorite I, a few. Games. Yeah, I have I have one favorite account, and Gmail? that is my Google account. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but which one of my dozen Gmail accounts? Nobody will know. <laughs> I think that the folders um, starts to become more more useful if you have like a family account and you are selectively sharing different folders with your family, kind of thing. So the one um, I use the folders for is I have a ton of work passwords yeah i'm a software developer i have billions of accounts for things it's insane and so this way when i'm done with a project that i'm no longer working on just i can just find the folder and just delete Mm, mm -hmm. don't want them anymore for two-factor code generation uh lastpass does uh have a separate app that you can install maybe that's for the better because that way you can use it maybe to a two factor itself. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. For emergency contact access, uh, yeah, uh, LastPass allows you to specify like a, another person uh, with another email address who you want them to, you know, get access to your account if anything happens to you and you can no longer log into your account. Um, and it lets you like uh, specify a certain amount of time. Like if I haven't logged into my LastPass account in the last thirty days, right? Then uh, then it'll send um, instructions to that other person to get access to your account. That's cool. Visual appeal of the app. Um, I like that they use Material Design uh, both on on Android and also like in their web and uh, and browser extension versions. Um, nice and consistent. Uh, um, so my thoughts are that it's too red and it looks like a giant error message all yeah. the time. I mean, like, once you're used to the fact that, like, oh yeah, their their color their color scheme is red, then it's like, yeah, it it looks normal. Yeah, unless um, you get, do get an error message and then it's not branding, it's actually important. Yeah, I wonder what what do error messages even look like in last pass? Uh, I don't know. Sometimes it'll be yellow if it's like a warning, mm-hmm. like if your session expired. And then it'll be red if it's actually yeah. there. Yep. I mean, I mean, when you're looking at your vault, they they have like really large logos next to most of the sites, uh, so that it's kind of you know easier to just visually scan through and find what you're looking for. Yep. Um. So yeah, it's a nice app to use. They do have an extra feature that that I haven't seen implemented in most other password managers so far, um, and that is auto changing passwords, um, which is a really really cool concept. Um, where like, you know, it's, it's literally like a one click button and then LastPass will open up a new tab and like, you know, log into whatever account you told them to change the password for. And like, you can watch this thing, go through the web page and go through the steps of like changing your password. Um, I think that the reason that most other password managers have not tried to implement this feature is because man, is it hit or miss. <laughs> Don't rely on that feature. Yeah. It's kind of cool that they tried, though. It's cool that they tried, <laughs> yes. Yep. Um, so any uh, final thoughts, other notes on, on LastPass? Yeah, I think my impression of LastPass overall is that my parents use it. Mm-hmm. Like, I have successfully made two people who know technology, know how to use computers, move away from using a single password or, you know, derived password. So, like... Cute cats one two three four, cute cats one two three four five, and so on, to actually mm-hmm. using real generated passwords for everything, and a secure master password and a secure Gmail password. I haven't got them to two factor yet, but this is a step <laughs> in the right direction. Yeah, it is. It's amazing what people will do. Like it, 
people will actually when you give have, them the proper tools, right? People will actually have a real password. LastPass is a great first manager. Like if you need, like to me, it's the generic manager. Yeah. If you don't know what you need, this is fine. Agreed. Agreed. Unless, unless in my research here, I find another one that has a good free tier. I think this is the one that I will probably recommend for, you know, the vast majority of people who do not want to pay, you know, an annual subscription yep. uh, for a password manager. Right. All right. Next, let's talk about Dashlane. I don't actually know anybody who uses Dashlane personally, so so I downloaded it and tested it myself. Um, let's talk about the platforms that it's available on. It has browser extensions for all of the major browsers that you could possibly want, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, Opera, um, it also has desktop clients for Windows and Mac, um, as well as mobile apps on Android and iOS. Um, one unusual thing that Dashlane does is uh, sometimes the browser extensions that they have um, can only be installed if you already have the desktop client installed on your computer, and then it will prompt you to install the browser extension for each of the browsers that you use, um, which is very odd. Like, it, you can find it on Chrome. It's in the Chrome Web Store. But when I was looking for it for Firefox, for example, uh, it wasn't listed in, in Firefox's add-on store. Um, I had to use the, the Dashlane desktop app to install it. Um, and this, like, this will work for the most part for you um, unless you are using... A, uh, a computer that you don't have the admin password for, right? So when I go to school, uh, I would I don't think I would be able to use Dashlane very effectively um, because I wouldn't be able to install the browser extensions uh, on my work computer. For price, uh, Dashlane does have a free version, but it limits you to 50 passwords, uh, and you can't synchronize those passwords to any other devices. It's just locally to your one device, um, which means that really, like, the free tier is not going to satisfy uh, all of the essential features that we uh, that we listed earlier in this episode so you're going to want to do the premium version for Dashlane uh, which costs $60 a year um, and then they also have a premium plus version which is $120 per year um, and that's a lot pricier that's way higher than any of the other uh, competitors that we've looked at so far um, so I'll talk a little bit about, uh, later about what features you get for each of those, uh, each of those tiers. Dashlane does have a very good security reputation. I have found absolutely nothing online about, uh, past breaches or about any concerns that anybody has about the, um, the protocols that they use for, uh, for storing, um, or authenticating their services. Dashlane can capture the credentials for accounts that you input in your browser. Um, I did find it to be a little bit inconsistent. It wasn't always able to automatically detect the uh, usernames and passwords that I was putting in. Uh, it offers random string generation to uh, create new passwords. Dashlane does support importing and exporting your uh, password vault. Dashlane allows you to store other security info. Um, they have notes, personal info, credit cards, IDs, and receipts. And, uh, and they do have notes that can be attached to the, um, the usernames and passwords that you have in your vault. Dashlane's security audit will highlight compromised passwords, weak passwords, and reused passwords, uh, and it gives you a numerical score based on this. Dashlane allows you to share passwords with other people, um, but they do have to have a Dashlane account as well. Uh, anytime that you change the password on your end, it updates on their account as well, which is great. Um, and you can also choose to give that other person uh, only read access for the password or read and write access, which is pretty cool. In order to organize passwords in Dashlane, uh, they allow you to create different categories. So it's not uh, a folder hierarchy system, but you can, uh, uh, you can essentially tag things in a, into particular categories. 
Dashlane does not offer a two-factor authentication generator, so you'll have to use a third-party one for that. Dashlane does offer uh, emergency contact access, um, and you actually get to choose which accounts from your vault they will get access to once, uh, once they gain access. Um, and they also have to wait for a specified amount of time after, after requesting access to your account. For biometric sensors, um, Dashlane supports uh, yeah, biometric sensors on Android and iOS, as expected, but it also supports Windows Hello, which I was not expecting, and I have not seen that uh, available for any of the other um, password managers that I have tested. Um, and, and yeah, that is definitely one of the advantages of having a desktop application instead of just having uh, browser extensions. As for visual appeal for the apps, uh, Dashlane has a very blue color scheme. Uh, it looks very nice and it has very friendly icons. And it grabs nice big logos from each of the websites that you are storing passwords for. Dashlane does have some pretty cool features that I didn't see in any other password managers so far. Um, the premium subscription in addition to allowing you to uh, uh, store unlimited passwords and synchronize those passwords across different devices. It also comes with a VPN, um, which uh, we haven't seen in any other password managers. Um, if you go with the Premium Plus uh, subscription, which again is, is the $120 a year subscription, um, that one also comes with a credit score, identity protection, um, and uh, and some ind identity insurance actually. Um, so if you are like really really serious about um, making sure that you are uh, secure online, this might actually be one of the better options um, because it has uh, so many things in addition to just being a uh, a password manager. And Dashlane also. Uh, offers an auto change password feature just like LastPass, but this one actually seems to work a little bit better than LastPass's. Um, it, it doesn't have to like open up uh, an, an extra tab in your browser. Um, it seems to work more consistently than LastPass's does. Um, so I'd say that uh, Dashlane did a really good job on that one. Uh, one final note about Dashlane is that the onboarding was really, really aggressive when I first created my account and started using the different apps. Um, the the like tutorials and prompts that it was giving me uh, as I'm trying to use this this um, this app uh, were pretty distracting, pretty heavy-handed, um, and uh, and kind of got in my way. The autofill feature on older versions of Android was a little bit inconsistent. Those are, um, if you have an old enough version of Android where it doesn't have the uh, built-in password manager hook um, at the system level, uh, Dashlane has a, uh, they'll, they'll use accessibility settings, uh, uh, accessibility access to monitor your um, the websites and, and apps that you're using to try to autofill passwords. Um, but I, it, it had a few hiccups while I was using it, which I was not seeing for other password managers. Also on desktop, uh, the desktop app and the browser extensions didn't seem to communicate with each other 100% of the time. Um, for example, when I when I uh, logged back into my computer after uh, going downstairs for lunch, um, the Chrome opened a new tab prompting me to install the Dashlane browser extension, but I already had the browser extension installed. So that's a little bit confusing. I think that that was the, uh, the Dashlane desktop app um, opening that tab to prompt me to, for some reason, install a browser extension that was already there. To talk about 1Password, uh, we have Brandon Johnson and Brian Mitchell, who I occasionally accidentally call Brian Johnson or Brandon Mitchell. <laughs> the second is much more common. I've heard that actually a few times. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so 1Password is the the entry in this list um that is is closest to like a, a first party 
Apple product. Um, and and I think that's probably why you guys initially were like discovered it. Does, is that fair to say? Absolutely. Uh, I'd say that there's definitely a type of software, particularly on iOS, but on macOS as well, like dating back to the 90s, that is kind of made the Apple way, for lack of a better phrase. Um, it's usually by small uh, like dev shops or even just um, in individual independent developers. And it's kind of built um, in kind of a way that, that prioritizes and respects Apple's human interface guidelines, this document that describes how um, Apple likes software to be built um, uh, fr from like a visual perspective as well as from uh, in, in some ways like a technical perspective as well. Yeah, um, kind of like the structure of it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And as as a result, um, like I think I heard about one password on uh, an Apple oriented podcast. Um, Brian, where did you hear about one password? I honestly couldn't tell you. I've so I've had it since 2014, and I know I'd heard about it for a year or two since before that. Um, probably just through Twitter. Uh, yeah, I didn't listen to podcasts at the time, so yeah, Twitter <laughs> and just reviews and security people and. So the the biggest difference I would say between like one password and a an Apple built um, password manager solution is that one password is like much more broad in terms of their their uh, support of of different platforms, right? Um, it's it's available on all of the major browsers uh, as extensions. It's available on Windows as well as Mac, iOS, Android uh, as native apps. Um, so it's Linux it's, as well. Yeah. And command line incidentally. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know what platform this doesn't run on. <laughs> uh, Vivaldi maybe. I bet it, I bet it would run on Vivaldi. I'm sure there's somebody who uses one password on Vivaldi <laughs> and, and that person is very grateful that they probably maybe perhaps have an extension there. <laughs> well, good thing. If it doesn't run on any one of those major platforms, there's a web version as well. Exactly. That's very true. Yeah. Um, the one of the big things that um, I, I think is probably going to be the, the major turnoff for most people who are shopping around for a password manager is the fact that there actually isn't a, a free version available. Um, I believe that like you can you can sort of maybe buy individual pet like uh, um licenses for like you know if you just want it on your mac or if you just want it on your ios device uh you could you can do that but like it won't synchronize in that case if you if you get the full package it's 36 dollars a year for a single person or 60 bucks a year for a family of five a little bit steeper than some of the uh some of the other options that we have here in this uh in this roundup yeah um i do think that one password has been like one of the most rock solid stable um, password managers out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I've been following them for at least the four years I have been a customer of theirs, but also just throughout the years beforehand, just on Twitter. And I've I really haven't heard hardly any or any problems related to security. Um, I mean, there are of course a few issues when like Safari Technical Preview first came out in their browser extension, but they updated very quickly um mm. they they update that thing all the time there's a there's a beta release channel where you get updates almost multiple times a week um they're always they're they updated for mojave and dark theme on launch day of mojave they're like as brennan was saying earlier it's um kind of that you know smaller dev company i do think they have hundreds of employees um but still they they release often and they you know kind of maintain the ecosystem guidelines yeah and they have like um a, a pretty good breakdown here on the website of like how they secure everything you know which is not like i i haven't seen that from most of these other uh password managers this this is very good documentation yeah i think a lot of that has to do with when one password does that and the team behind one password does that it's kind of their way of um stating their kind of confidence in in what they've built um and kind of opening opening that up for discussion too that i think i think you're right it's really unique um but i think it's definitely kind of a statement that um was kind of in, in, intentional about how they how they built this thing for mm -hmm. sure yeah 
One password, of course, can do the uh, the essentials. It can capture the credentials of a password that you you know have em- entered in on on a website or uh, if you're on your phone, you know, on on um, in its app. Um, it can generate a random string for you to uh, use as a password for for one of your sites. Um, importing and exporting is a little bit weird. They have an import option, but I didn't see. I didn't see an export option, at least not on um, that same page. There is right now. I'm going to try running it. Um, so you can export as a 1Password interchange format, which is .1PIF, or a CSV, or a tab delimited text, or which is a just text file. Okay, T-X-T. yeah. Um, CSV is the one that most would use. You can literally say uh, which fields to export. Do you want to do the title, the type, the URL, the password, username, mm-hmm. notes? So... They give you a lot of options for things to include in the export. They also give you a lot of options for other things that you might want to store on one password besides just passwords. Um, you know, you can you can store. What do you got, Brian, for us? Here, I can go down the list. Yeah. Logins, secure notes, credit cards, identities, passwords, documents, bank accounts, driver's license, memberships, passports, servers, social security numbers, software licenses, and wireless routers. Nice. So that's pretty much everything that you could need. Um, I think I have one of every type. Those are the different <laughs> categories. Nice. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I, I like when I when I bought one password, I didn't even realize they had software licenses. But I could finally clear out that folder in my email uh, inbox or <laughs> another email folder that was just every email license. Right. And I moved it into one password, and it's super easy. Like the other thing that I that I kind of. Uh didn't realize that i'd use about one password but i i use it pretty frequently is actually like the the kind of like transposition of like um like paper identifiers things like my driver's license and my passport or like bank account information routing numbers and account numbers and stuff like that it's yeah. so handy to have those in a system where you can where, where you can read them frequently like there are all sorts of situations that i never thought of where i'd need like my driver's license number <laughs> right like um mm-hmm. some some places use that as like a way to verify your identity or something like that and having that is like just in a copy paste situation is really great um like if you if you uh, uh have to open a bank account for example like i did recently for my business you need to have your driver's license for that um it's it's awesome to have uh, something that's kind of a repository for that. And I think 1Password made some really smart decisions about what what types to support. Um, security Audit is uh, a really nice feature to have. Um, I believe it's called Watchtower in 1Password. Uh, yeah. And they, the things that they emphasize in 1Password for this is um, they'll tell you the strength of your various passwords. Uh, they'll tell you if you, you reused any passwords anywhere. Um, they actually, this is a really cool one, they will highlight any passwords where two-factor authentication is available, but you do not currently have it activated. Um, and of course, they only know that if you use 1Password as your two-factor authentication um generator uh but you can do that what do you know it's it has great a t- um i'll just go in a little more about the two factor on on one password um i didn't use it for a while i used like authy or duo for a little bit because mm-hmm. i didn't realize that one password could do it um but it's a, a field you can create a new you know custom field in an entry and do one time password and then it comes up with a little box to scan a qr code or you can paste in the you know two factor generation link um but uh, when you're using it on the iOS 12 password manager extension, uh-huh. um, you, know, you can select the one password and then you type it. It does face ID or touch ID to enter the password. And then the next screen and you just hit paste. Nice. It automatically pastes and copies it to your clipboard. Um, um, I, I would like to note that it did take me a minute to find where to like how to get a two factor authentication uh, you know, QR code scanned into um, one password because it's you know it's it's not like one section of the app that's that holds all of your two-factor authentication uh, codes that are being generated. You have to go into that specific account and then add a new field and then specify that it's a two-factor authentication. You know, it's a little bit complicated. And I think I was yeah I was a little confused about that when I first started doing two-factor and one password, but I think that's because 
I had separate apps that only did two factor. Yeah. And I only had a few entries in those apps. And so, you know, thinking back on it, I don't want a se- a separate area in one password just for two factor because then I'd be scrolling through finding the password, copying it, going back, going to a new area, scrolling through finding the, the right. two factor there and right. copying it. Um, f- I can keep going down vulnerable pa- uh, or watchtower. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, vulnerable passwords are, I think, a new feature in One Password Seven, mm-hmm. and that uses the database from Have I Been Pwned dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, reused passwords, that's pretty obvious. Um, weak passwords, let's see, unsecured website. So that's if the um, URL for a website is HTTP and not HTTPS. Uh, huh. I will warn you about that. Um, I think there's also a section for passwords that haven't been changed in a while. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm also looking on this side menu in the Mac app since that's where I am right now. Um, You can kind of categorize things by using a tag. Um, So, for example, if you tag something with the note Apple Watch, it's a magic tag, so then things get sent to your Apple Watch. And so that was really handy for getting one-time passwords, so two-factor passwords. Mm -hmm. When I'm signing in on a new computer or something, I can just pull it up on my watch and get the two-factor code. Um, Now with iOS 12 and the Password Manager API, I don't really use that feature much anymore, but... It's nice to know that I can. So wait, so um, so will it only send something to the Apple Watch if you have given it the Apple Watch tag? Yep. Huh, interesting. You can also create a mul- multiple vaults. Um, so I have one that's called personal and one that's called work. So I put anything related to my work stuff ah, in my mm-hmm. work account there. Um, and so that's, you know, like my, my work Apple ID and then my personal Apple ID is my personal account. Um, and I think this really comes into play when you're using teams and families. So you can have a vault for each person, and you can probably grant or remove access per vault to different people. Um, yeah, and I believe I believe that for sharing stuff, that's the only level that you can do it at is on the vault level, and um, and I think you have to be like in a family, you know, you have to have like a family account kind of thing, um, or some sort of team account in order to share stuff with other people. Looks like you can manage access there you can mark them as safe for travel or not safe for travel so if you go to travel mode it will remove any offline data it has about any of your passwords one password does not have like an emergency contact feature implemented um which i think more speaks to like their their security philosophy than like an unwillingness to implement that type of um that type of feature um because when as soon as you create your account they do have you download a, um, what do they call it? A security package or something like that? Um, uh, uh, you make a security kit or emergency kit emergency. for 1Password. There's, yeah. there's that Apple influence. Everything's a kit. <laughs> a um, go, go listen to PodKit, yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so this, this is like, uh, a, it's intended to be a sheet of paper that you print out. And, you know, it uh, it has... A lot of the information about like you know what's what's the email address that you use to create your account what is the secret key um and then it doesn't have your password on the page but you it's expected that you like write that down on the piece of paper um and so it's it's, it's instead of having like a digital solution for giving a loved one access to your account if you are no longer capable of getting into your account uh, then they will have this very important paper hopefully in a fireproof box somewhere how about a plastic box in a wooden apartment (laughs) Uh, i think that's great but i think you should add some like gasoline kerosene something like that (laughs) um you know some matches just just to be safe yeah totally in terms of uh, visual appeal of the app itself, um, I really like the the nice friendly icons that they use for everything. Yeah, um, I think their their design is is quite nice. It's it's, it's not one hundred percent Apple like. I do think they've veered off a, a little bit, but it's definitely in the same realm. Um, they support the dark theme and the light theme in macOS Mojave, for example, um, and it, and each app does use some system elements in each of their uh, corresponding platforms um yeah they're nice from the icons as you said um for websites and things they pulled on the favicons or any higher resolution favicon that is available so yeah you get nice glyphs next to each website i don't know what other apps use i've never used another password managers but um it's quite nice and appealing all right so next up we have keeper 
Keeper is available for all the platforms that we could uh, possibly want it on. Um, it even has the the desktop version that they put on Windows is released through the uh, the Microsoft Store, which is uh, an unusual amount of uh, first party integration on the Windows side. Um, the free version, unfortunately, does not synchronize between devices. Um, you will have to pay $30 a year for a single plan for that or $60 a year for a family of five. As for its security reputation, uh, Keeper is actually in a similar boat to LastPass. They got in trouble a couple of years ago for uh, a vulnerability in their browser extensions where the browser extension could be tricked into autofilling passwords into a malicious password field. Keeper has most of the essentials that we're looking for, except for, strangely, it doesn't capture credentials. Uh, if I go and log into a website that Keeper has never seen me log into before, it, it does not prompt to save that um, password in Keeper, so I would have to go and manually add that to my uh, vault, and if you ask me, life is too short to go to those lengths. Um, also, I noticed that using password autofill on mobile was a little bit janky. On Android, the approach that they use is Keeper presents itself as a third-party keyboard to the operating system. Um, and so when you want to fill in some passwords into a password field, you switch from your default keyboard to Keeper. And... Um, and then you, you know, choose, it, it, it tries to detect which uh, account you're going to be filling in and, uh, and presents that to you. Um, it doesn't seem to know what order to fill the fields in. So, for example, uh, when I was trying to log into Ars Technica, uh, they, uh, Chrome automatically filled in my username. So I just immediately went to the password field and then I clicked on Keeper to have it autofill, but Keeper didn't know that I was in the password field, so it put my username into the password field. And then I switched back to the username field, and it put my password into the username field, which was kind of goofy. Importing and exporting is also uh, a little bit of a strange experience for Keeper. Um, it does support importing and exporting CSV files uh, on their web version, um, but not on the desktop version for some reason. Um, when, when I first created the account on the desktop version and it prompted me to import uh, some passwords into it, um, it didn't give me the option of, of giving it a file. It just automatically tried to find my passwords, and I have no idea where it was looking for those. It did manage to find my work account password, and I have absolutely no idea where it was importing that from, uh, which is pretty creepy. Keeper has a security audit where they will uh, highlight things that you might be doing wrong, and they actually give you a numerical score. Um, but for some reason, you can't see the security audit through the desktop client again. Um, you can only do that on the mobile apps or in the, uh, in the, on the web version. Keeper lets you share passwords with somebody else. Uh, of course, that other person does have to have a Keeper account as well. Um, and you can choose to give that person uh, only read access or read and write access. So it's a pretty robust version of this. Uh, it's a pretty robust implementation of this feature. Keeper does not have a two-factor authentication generator built into it, um, nor does it allow you to uh, create a, a or designate a an emergency contact who can access your account uh, if you are compromised. For biometric sensors, uh, of course, it supports that on Android and iOS as expected, but it also supports Windows Hello. So Keeper is uh, pretty well integrated into the Windows ecosystem uh, if you're if you're using that side of things. As for visual appeal. Keeper uh, does have a variety of themes, like color themes, to choose from for the apps. Um, it looks fine, nothing really special there. And Keeper has a few pretty cool features. Um, it can hide itself from screenshots not only on mobile, um, but also 
on the desktop version. Uh, it can it can hide itself from screenshots and from video recordings. I tested this both uh, by taking a, a screenshot through the system level uh, on Windows. Also, I tried to record in OBS, and uh, and the window was blacked out in there. Um, but it doesn't prevent a hardware-based recording solution, of course, such as uh, NVIDIA Shadowplay. Also, Keeper has a chat client available, which is rather unusual. Um, I haven't tried it because, like, you need other people to chat with in this chat client, but if you are obsessed with security and you can convince your friends to use Keeper as well, I guess you can use Keeper's chat client. More power to you. I did have one other thing that was rather difficult with Keeper. Uh, I was trying to set up two-factor authentication to protect my Keeper account, um, and for some reason, when I... so so it gives you the option of doing SMS or like a um, a password generator app. Um, and so when I chose password generator app, it immediately asked, prompted me for a code from the app, but it had not yet given me like a QR code or a secret key to put into the app. So my app doesn't have a code yet that it has generated. So th that's kind of broken. Overall, uh, I would say that Keeper since it it is a mixed bag in terms of the implementation for some of these features, um, I don't see a reason to use it over any of the other uh, password managers that we're taking a look at today. Um, maybe it'll improve in the future, but for now, uh, it doesn't really seem worth it. Now, Ryan, do we want to talk about the password manager that you have moved to after leaving LastPass. We should talk about that, Ian. Do you know what it's called? Uh, I believe it's called Bitwarden, That's and right. I was going to go and install it on all of my devices and test it out and uh, and everything before we recorded this review, but I did not have time, so lucky me, you are here and you have used it. I have used it, and in fact, I'm going to open it right now on my phone because I want to see what it looks <laughs> like. Um, so I switched to Bitwarden maybe a year ago now i'm not exactly sure it was probably a few months after um the acquisition um of LastPass from logmian mm -hmm. and basically uh every every month or so LastPass will be on uh, or some discussion on hacker news will be about password managers and so it might either be LastPass or dash lanes or one password something something somebody did in the news will cause password managers to come up on Hacker News. Sure, sure. And so um, people will always ask, so if I shouldn't be using LastPass, what's better? And of course, that's a legit question to ask because, you know, somebody must know. And so what comes up a lot is and, Bitwarden. And that's, that's the question that we're trying to answer here as well. Right. And so what will come up often is Bitwarden. But what's cool about Bitwarden is that it's blue instead of red. No, that's not the answer. <laughs> um so, so a lot of the stuff that we talked about for LastPass still apply. So let's go through some of that list and see what differs. Definitely. Um, the biggest difference initially is that it's open source. And not just a little bit open okay. source. Entirely open source. The server-side implementation that does all the encryption, does all the password management, does all the database management, that stores the encrypted blobs of data, all of that's open source. I like that. It runs in .NET Core. It runs on a simple uh, MySQL database or something. There are alternative implementations because it is open source. It or conforms to a spec. So there's a Rust implementation. There probably are others that I don't know about. The client apps are open source. So the Android app is open source. The iOS app is open source. The extensions are open source. All the source code is in plain sight on a GitHub repo. You can make pull requests. You can audit the code anytime you want to. It's cool and it's great. That's the biggest and, e and even if you difference. are not somebody who is going to be able to go and audit the code yourself, this still gives you the advantage of like the community being able to audit the code anytime they want, and so things will get flagged. Right, and so I think I think it's um, it's really interesting that it's open source. Uh, recently, uh, Bitwarden went through one of uh, through a, an actual third party code audit, and they found one minor flaw that mm -hmm. was fixed and the rest of the code is very safe and sound. So um, they will periodically go through those third-party code audits um, 
it's really nice that you can actually just see source code for something. Now, this doesn't matter for a regular consumer. So again, I wouldn't say LastPass is worse because it's not open source. But for a different crowd, for a different audience, this is a great feature. Yeah, for um, sure. Another interesting feature um, about this specific difference is that the server that you put all your data on, well, what if somebody operates a server and suddenly they sell themselves like LastPass? Well, <laughs> with Bitwarden, what the difference is, you can actually host your own server, your own virtual private server or you know whatever, and you can put this open source software on your own server and run mm -hmm. it, and you can have all your clients point to your own hardware, your own domain, and so on. And it'll all still work, but it'll be on your hardware on your own terms. If you want to have, if you want to whitelist your own IP address, or if you want to add customizations, it's all on you to do so. It's really cool. Like there's so much more flexibility here for some serious paranoia. Now I do wonder, um, like, are are all of the uh, major platforms covered by like Bitwarden, the the entity, the company, right? That yep. that provides the source code. Um, yep, that's right. Okay, good. So let's talk about price for all of that, yes. for all of that open sourceness. How much does it cost? Well, it's free. Woo woo. Um, like like honestly, like like all of the features are available for free, or so, are there any restrictions? So, so there are some additional features that you can pay for. So it does have some sharing features that that are built in. I believe you have to pay for those. Uh, and then it also has um, uh, two factor password or two factor code um key generators in it as well okay uh, and then you just pay and how much do you pay well it's ten dollars a year uh that seems pretty aggressive and i agree it's a good price um so i've been paying that and it's not a problem for me yeah that's pretty awesome and you get um two-step login with yubikey um utf or u2f or duo and those are physical hardware dongles if you are so paranoid you can have those. So those are those are physical USB keys that you need to use to log into your Bitwarden account, Correct. right? Correct. Okay, yes. got it. Um, and then, of course, you get priority custom support, customer <laughs> support. Um, they also have a, a business tier and a families tier in case you need those. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty much pretty much uh, just fine there. That's awesome. Yeah. Pretty good price. Um, security reputation is pretty good. Very recent code audit, very good. I mean, yeah, if, if it's source, good. being uh, if it's being like recommended on Hacker News on a regular basis, uh, I'd say it probably has a pretty good reputation. Yeah, pretty good. So one of the weird things is that um, you can actually request features, and so somebody requested um, on one of the platforms. I don't know if it was iOS or Android. Somebody requested passphrase generation. So instead of just being a random string of gobbledygook, mm -hmm. it would generate like correct horse staple battery you know so just select a, a you know five five words so and string them English together words okay and then mm. it would it would just it, and so I'm, i believe that feature was added to one of the clients i don't know which one so the clients mm. aren't always in parity but they're pretty close usually okay so there is a security audit but it's probably not as cool as uh last passes version there's mm -hmm. no score there's no ranking it'll tell you if a password's weak overall um, and I believe it'll also run through your passwords across, um, you know, an index of already breached passwords. Right. Um, it'll it'll check, uh, have I been pwned or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there is a sharing mechanism, but I'm pretty sure you have to pay for it. And yeah, that's all I know about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, it has folders. Uh, recent feature, and now it has nested folders. This is apparently a big deal to somebody on Hacker News, and so that was added. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it has built-in support for the two-factor code generation. Um, so you supply the initial code mm -hmm. for a specific domain or site or whatever, and it'll just keep looping, you know, your two-factor codes right. internally. This is a cool feature, but you do have to pay for it. Um, does that synchronize back to your account? It does. Okay. Yep. So I don't, I don't know if it has two-factor login overall. It might. I'm not sure. Um, one would hope. Yeah, I don't know. Um. I don't think it has emergency contact access. It wasn't really built for that feature. Visual appeal. Um, it's really blue. Dabba dee dabba die. 
it's it's um it's not material design totally i mean it has a little bit of that uh i think it's just because they're using whatever open source ui kit they're using um okay. but it's a very plain ui you know it has icons for everything um yeah i mean it's a browser extension that fills in passwords that's cool uh let's see anything else here yeah no i think that's pretty much all i can say about bitwarden like i use it because i didn't like what happened with LastPass, and Mm -hmm. i wanted to support a different team now that was growing and doing stuff um ten dollars is basically free a year like yeah it hurts and i mean that it's so cheap (laughs) you have such a unique perspective on that i know (laughs) Um, and yeah, wow. I mean, like, since um, Bitwarden has all of the, like, r- required features uh, for free, like, I, you know what? I think I might have no problem recommending this to everybody, basically, now. So I think I think there's a, there's a lot of g- great stuff about Bitwarden. Um, my, one of my concerns is I don't actually know who works on it. So you can read the source code, of course, <laughs> and you can go find out who they are. But I don't know who they are, and that mm-hmm. that's kind of spooky to me in a way. Like I don't know anybody who works like by name on L- LastPass either. But who are the people who work on Bitwarden? And as a company, how safe is it? I don't know. I can't answer that. And so without mm-hmm. being able to answer that, like what if development stops tomorrow? Well, so I'm sure it'll work for a year, maybe two years. I'm sure there will be an open source fork eventually. Because the community is probably big enough at this point, but it certainly doesn't have the t- the the business momentum that LastPass currently does. Sure, yeah, and that's my expert opinion. And now the last password manager that we're going to discuss today is KeePass. Uh, KeePass is probably the most unique uh, option in this list. Um, it is a completely open source project, uh, completely free, um, though it doesn't take the same approach as most of the others. Um, The only official builds of this software are for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and actually the Mac and Linux versions are literally just running an emulated version of the Windows client, which is the only one that was, you know, built by the uh, the first party uh, creator. However, there are many, many, many other platforms that have unofficial ports, um, and many of them are listed on the official website, uh, which makes me believe that they uh, have maybe not been 100% audited by the original creator, but uh, they, they have their uh, kind of seal of approval uh, on, on some of those unofficial ports. KeePass seems to have a fantastic security reputation. Um, According to their website, even NASA trusts KeePass to uh, store their secure information. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but I have uh, not come across anybody complaining about uh, KeePass being insecure. The major drawback here is that KeePass is a lot more complicated to use than the other password managers. Um, For example... Can it synchronize across devices? Well, that's entirely up to you. You see, KeePass just saves the uh, database that you create for all of your usernames and passwords. It encrypts that uh, based on whatever master key, master password you uh, you use. And then you've just got this file. Um, it's, it's a very, like... 2003 era solution. You can do whatever you want with this file. So um, I very, very quickly was able to just save that file to uh, my Google Drive, and then um, on my phone, I installed an unofficial port of, uh, of KeePass, um, and I directed that, that app to open up that file uh, from Google Drive, and I put in my master password, and there you go. I was able to uh, open it up. So there isn't an official first-party synchronization solution but you can come up with your own solution if you if you want to capturing credentials is also a complicated business um the windows client the official windows client doesn't detect when you put in uh usernames and passwords into web pages on your browser um but 
I'm you may be able to find a browser extension uh, version of KeePass made by some other entity uh, that could capture your your passwords for you. KeePass's import options uh, really, really excel. It has a lot of different options for different formats that you can import uh, your password collection from, from other password managers. Um, it also can export either as um, the, the uh, KeePass-specific format or as just a regular like CSV file. KeePass doesn't seem to be built to store much other security info other than... Um, other than usernames and passwords, um, but you can do a lot with just text fields. KeePass does not offer a security audit feature. Uh, it won't look at all of your passwords to tell you um, whether any of them are weak or anything, but on an individual basis, when you're looking at each individual entry, uh, it will tell you based on how many characters are in the password uh, how strong it is. Though it doesn't take into account you know, whether this... Uh, you could have a very long password that is based on uh, only, like... English words that could be uh, cracked very easily. KeePass also doesn't offer the feature of uh, sharing passwords with other users. Um, it also does not come with a two-factor authentication generator uh, or emergency contact access. Um, and as for biometric sensor authentication, uh, it really depends on the client that you get um, because as I mentioned, there's a lot of different options, and they can become pretty confusing pretty fast. Visual appeal is definitely not one of KeePass's strong suits. Um, the first-party application for Windows, um, it looks like it was built for Windows XP, and I really don't miss those days. I, I really don't look like looking at uh, the KeePass window. Um, and the uh, the client that I found for Android uh, similarly looked like it was built for I don't know Android 4.0. It was it's it's uh, pretty ugly to look at today in 2018. So my big takeaway for KeePass is well it is a. Uh, it seems to be a very very secure system, uh, and it it hands over almost all of the control to the user. Um, that is also kind of its biggest flaw, is that it, it doesn't provide a lot of framework for the user. Um, the user has to do everything on their own. So if you are the type of person who enjoys that kind of thing and wants to be in complete control, um, then this may be a good option for you. But for the vast majority of users, uh, I, I can't really recommend uh, doing key pass because there's just too much extra work that you have to put in also it's ugly all right so what did we learn today about password managers there are a lot of options out there and which one you choose really depends on what exactly you're looking for um, for the vast majority of users who are probably looking for a free solution uh, i would definitely recommend checking out either bitwarden or lastpass they both offer all of the essential features that we're looking for for free. Um, Bitwarden, to me, seems like it has a better security reputation, um, but as Ryan brought up, LastPass does probably have a better chance of being financially sustainable, so um, if you are worried about uh, Bitwarden not being able to afford to continue development of their product, uh, you might want to go with LastPass. If you are somebody who is looking not only for a password manager, but also for uh, something that provides a VPN and identity protection, uh, Dashlane would probably be a good option, though it is definitely the most expensive one on here. If you're someone who has drunk the Apple Kool-Aid and has gone all in on their ecosystem, uh, 1Password would probably be the option on here that feels the most at home. Uh, and if you're a real nerd who wants to uh, use the most hardcore looking uh, <laughs> open source solution that puts everything into your own hands, uh, KeePass would probably be uh, a good choice. 
The only one on this list that I really wouldn't recommend for anybody is Keeper, um, because in in pretty much any every category, every way that I look at it, uh, there are better better options on this list than than Keeper. It's just not a keeper. All right, I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Second Opinion, the very first roundup that we have ever done. If you like this format and want to hear more of them, uh, I have a few ideas for other products, other categories that we can do roundups of. Uh, in particular, I am researching a whole bunch of podcast players um, because go figure, as a podcast creator and as an avid listener of podcasts, I uh, have a lot of opinions about those. Um, but I really want to hear what you guys are interested in as well. Um, and over on our Patreon, we've got a, a little poll set up for you to uh, voice your opinions. Our Patreon can be found at patreon.com slash TV. Second Opinion is a production of The Nexus TV. We are a network of technology-focused podcasts based in St. Paul, Minnesota. The show is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so if you would like to use any part of it, feel free to do so as long as you link back to the original page, which was thenexus.tv slash SO54. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at r slash thenexus.tv. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from From the the Technological technological Convergence. Convergence. Tech news is dominated by big announcements with big, bombastic personalities. Sometimes they make us laugh. Yes, I'd like to order 4,000 lattes to go, please. Sometimes we laugh at them. Courage. Sometimes we're filled with awe. There it is. Check that out. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. They never want us to forget. Remember. That the show's never over. Because. I got one more thing. Now, it's often difficult to make the journey to see these events live. This is a freaking dirt road! Oh my god! (laughs) But we here at the Nexus TV have got you covered. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. So come join us as we explore the brave new worlds that await us. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today.